Today's webcast is artificial intelligence and higher education. Where are we going and how are we getting there? My name is Megan Raymond and I lead programs, events, sponsorship and membership here at WCET. So it's great to see so many familiar faces and new faces. You are welcome to download the slides and follow along. And then if you have any questions during the conversation today, we ask that you enter those into the Q&A because we anticipate that we'll have a pretty active chat dialogue and we don't want to lose your questions during the Q&A portion. So go ahead and enter questions into the Q&A and feel free to share resources, experiences, lessons learned in the chat. We also tend to have a pretty active Twitter discussion if you want to follow along there. The hashtag is WCET webcast. Any resources that are shared We'll make sure to pass those along with the link to the recording next week. I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's moderator, who I am pleased and fortunate to call a longtime friend and colleague. Van Davis is the Chief Strategy Officer here at WCET, and he's the Service Design and Strategy Officer with Every Learner Everywhere. Please welcome Van. Thanks, Megan. Um, we are really excited about this conversation on artificial intelligence uh, and what it means for higher education, and are really fortunate to have two extraordinary experts. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and then you just saw that there's a poll that popped up. So while they're introducing themselves, please um, follow along with that poll. We'd like to know whether or not you've experimented with ChatGPT. Uh, George, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks and hello, uh, everyone. I hope you're all having a, a fantastic day, regardless of temperature and quantity of snow. Um, so I'm George Siemens. I'll talk a little bit about maybe just background in coming to this conversation uh, and uh, situating a little bit in what is shaping the conversations, at least that I'm currently a part of. So I've got a very simple formula that I've had for probably about a decade plus now on where things are trending in this particular conversation. And it's something to the effect of, uh, you know, digital equals data equals analytics equals AI. And so that little four part model uh, essentially is where we've been trending since we really started moving content, curriculum and related resources online. And so initially, uh, this came through just the form I was at University of Manitoba at the time and experimenting with running courses online and we ran an open online course at the time that uh, for, for us at least was reasonably large in size and it produced uh, a, a really interesting experience of the, the being digital suddenly you had this trace data conversational or log data depending on system people were using social media I think we called it web 2.0 at the time back in the day. And uh, it, it's seeing this data get generated through this digital process, um, ended up uh, setting up the next stage. And at that point, I was at Athabasca University in, in Alberta, Canada. And we started at that stage with an organization or a small conference uh, that we held in Banff, uh, Alberta at the time, where we started looking at this idea of what do we do with the data that's collected as individuals learn in digital environments? And that sort of launched the start of what we're now classifying as uh, learning analytics as a field. And uh, that area of focus continued to increase in, in interest. And as you started getting larger and larger data sets with greater and greater outputs, you ended up uh, with something that gained a lot of attention in the sub communities within learning analytics uh, called obviously artificial intelligence. So the short model is if it's digital, it generates data. If you have data, you have analytics and analytics at best is sort of purgatory until AI shows up and you can start doing work with it. Now, um, about five years ago, we started turning our attention a little bit more and that, that group, we've got our next conference in, uh, in learning analytics in uh, Arlington, Texas in about uh, three weeks. So y'all are welcome. It's March 13th uh, on that week, uh, spring break. And then we turn to uh, looking at specifically artificial intelligence. What does it do and how does it impact the educational process? And we held uh, you know, several years of conferences. Our next one is being held December, uh, this, uh, this December in uh, uh, Arizona State uh, University. Uh, and I'll drop a few links as I'm done chatting here. And with that particular event, the intention was to say, look, with large enough data sets and complex enough interactions, 
between students and with curriculum and otherwise, you start to get to the point where you automate parts of the process or where you just exceed the scale of human ability to do what we want to do with our classrooms in these online settings. And as a result of that, we created an organization called Braille, uh, the Global Research Alliance for AI Learning and Education. And we hold you know, everything from webinars to uh, write uh, position papers to uh, finding ways to engage and support institutional deployment of uh, artificial intelligence to various settings. So blah, blah, blah. That's the background. So I'm seeing it from that learning analytics lens first, the last five years from the AI and education lens. What happened though, is there's a really large community, the AI and education community research-wise has been around for 20 years. There's enormous uh, input in this area, but in November, we had this sudden effect that probably all of you can't get away from now, which is a little tool set was uh, released, built off of, at that point, GPT-3, which is a large language model um, from this, this company called uh, OpenAI. Um, they'd already gotten a bit of recognition when they launched GPT-2, where they said, we can't release this publicly because it could be used by state level actors or big organizations for nefarious reasons. And what changed though, as people started interacting with chat GPT, which was brilliantly marketed, a very smooth interface for interacting with it. If you haven't tried it yet, I encourage you to at least log on, simple to create an account. Sometimes you'll hit bandwidth issues, unfortunately, and just play with it. Start asking it questions. It is after all a conversational agent. So what happens, the best way to describe, well, there's many ways to describe uh, what ChatGPT is, but it is for many people the experience of something having escaped a lab. So there are people who've been in this work for 20, 30 years of their career, tackling everything from what AI is to what AI does, to how AI can uh, have uh, ethical deployments you know, in terms of biases, how people from different uh, populations are impacted or harmed by it, and so on. Um, that they've been working this for such a long time that it seems like we're omitting the enormity of AI research and focusing on this tiny sliver, which is now a large language model that has a very accessible user interface. But what it does reveal to a much broader population is that AI now has a capability that we've traditionally felt is the domain of human thought and human capacity. And EFF runs a, an AI progress index that captures some of these dynamics that looks at, in this domain, AI can now cognitively outperform humans, meaning it is better at us in a range of strategy games. It is more effective at recognizing images. It can do things at scale that we simply can't. Uh, it is capable of beating us in games like chess and Go, and the list goes on. And so it seems like this exclusive domain of human thought that we've always felt we possess, it's been shrinking. And it's been shrinking for you know, certainly the last decade, but with the rise of transformer approaches and foundation models in AI, it had, seems to have accelerated at least the scope at which our ability to feel that we are the most intelligent or at least the supreme uh, intellectual beings on the planet is starting to come under question. And at least in some circles, because as many of you are aware, at best, chat GPT is round one of our more active engagement with these kinds of AI technologies. And that means that we are going to start to see ongoing progress and ongoing evolution. We Googled Lambda, for example, which uh, was a language model that at least publicly predated uh, what was being done with chat GPT and Blake Lemoyne was fired as a result of going public in, with this model. Uh, it's about five times the, so Lambda is about five times the size of GPT-3 just in terms of parameters. And what ended up happening was he went public, Blake Lemoyne said, this thing is sentient. It's the, you know, I'm speaking with an entity that's alive. And Google said, well, we don't want that. And so uh, whether that was a feeling or not, we get into a number of interesting questions, which we may unpack, and I'll throw it back to Van in a second. But it's this idea of is if something is capable of spurning or creating intellectual thought, if it's capable of moving us to more complex thinking, if it's able to create an outline of an essay in seconds or to transfer JavaScript into Python, you know, what might take days, if it can do it into, in seconds, questions start to arise, what does that mean for us? in the long run. You know, what does that mean for humanity? What does that mean for our schools? What does that mean for our classrooms? And we're just at the beginning stages of that conversation. And it moves anywhere from some experts saying, 
oh, you know, this is not a huge thing. Uh, you know, Noam Chomsky has opinions on what this is, and the list goes on. So I think that's a bit of a background and overview. So thank you. Thanks, George. Appreciate you setting the, the stage for us with this technology. Um, I think you saw that Kim threw up the results of that poll, and 62% of folks have experimented with chat GPT or another type of generative AI, and 38% of you have it. And I've noticed over in the chat, folks have been talking about the challenges now of, of getting into chat GPT because it is so popular. You know, one of the things that we're really struck by here at WCET is that technology innovations tend to happen in waves, that there's that first wave where there's all of the hype, and then there's that second wave where we really began to think about implications. And um, we're really lucky to have Karen with us this morning to talk about how institutions, one institution, in this case, Oregon State, is really grappling with chat GPT and other forms of generative AI. So, Karen, if I could ask you to introduce yourself and then talk to us a little bit about what's going on over at Oregon State and, and how you see this playing out in the classroom. Okay, sure. Thanks, Van. Uh, my name is Karen Watte. I'm the Director of Course Development and Training at Oregon State eCampus. I do have a few slides to sort of guide my, my comments, so thanks, Megan. Um, Oregon State, I work at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, we are an R1 public research institution. We're one of three land, sea, space, and sun grant institutions in the country. We have about 35,000 students, undergrad and grad. Um, I work at OSU eCampus, which is the centralized support unit, a distance education unit at OSU. Uh, uh, and uh, we currently offer 101 degrees and certificates fully online, and about one of every Three OSU students is an eCampus student, so we're serving about 14,000 fully distance uh, students. Uh, within eCampus, I actually lead the course development unit, which consists of about 45 staff, and about half of those are instructional designers and, and trainers, and the other half are multimedia developers and programmers. So we have a, a really great group of brilliant professionals who have rich and diverse backgrounds, and so um, we really work to help faculty be innovative in that teaching and learning space. Um, if you can advance to the next slide. So with this advent of this next phase of, of AI, as George was describing earlier, um, it's resulted in a lot of conversation on our campus, as I'm sure it has at your institutions as well. And uh, one thing that may be a little bit unique about our OSU faculty is they teach across modalities. So they'll the same faculty member will teach their course um, on campus as teaches it on, fully online, as teaches it in a, a hybrid uh, modality. So as a centralized support unit, we really get a bird's eye view, I think, um, as we interact with, uh, with the faculty across all of our disciplines in terms of their reactions to new uh, technology, new ideas uh, that are coming up. So many of the things I'm going to share here in these in this opening um, statement come from not only the information that's been published, you know, on a daily basis about this uh, over the last several months, but also from conversations that we've had directly with our faculty and that I've had with our team who works with our faculty. And many uh, several, several members of my team are really digging into understanding how this is affecting um, teaching and learning today. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so OSU has been working on first uh, an institutional response and our Vice Provost of Academic Affairs pulled together a small task force to start drafting a few guidelines, which I think we're going to publish here this week, uh, to help faculty begin to navigate this new reality. And we've um, come upon two major principles and then one area of consideration. Uh, and the first is that we're really advocating that faculty remember to embrace change because um, our associate provost at least has made it clear that we are not going to be building a wall around the institution. Um, the tools that we use, of course, change over time, you know, as George was describing, you know, that the way things evolve. Um, and often these tools can change the way we think about things. Uh, and students really need to know, you know, what's out there, what tools they should, could use, and what the strengths and limitations are of these tools. 
And then also we have to re continue to recognize that a lot of times these tools open new creative possibilities. That's really the first, the first principle. The second, though, is also to recognize the importance of accountability because we, we know that faculty are really responsible for providing some structure for learning and for identifying those elements and assignments that will lead to students reaching certain learning outcomes. Um, so it, it includes being clear when certain tools can be used to support learning. Um, it also involves analyzing and updating assessments so that they reflect this new reality in the world. And then this third item, uh, of course, we there are some considerations around academic integrity, but we don't want to get entirely mired down or lost in this idea of, oh no, what if students cheat? <laughs> um, because we know that a student who wants to cheat will find a way to cheat regardless. Um, and so I think we really need to reframe that conversation to be more about number one, how are we designing our learning experiences and our courses and our assessments so that they're more robust and respond to whatever the environment is today? And I'll get into a couple, a little more on that in a moment. But number two, how are we communicating to students about why integrity is important and what they are here to learn? Um, and how is it important in both the academic discipline and in the broader field that they're entering into? So what's the impact on them tomorrow if they would cheat today by using any kind of tool that they might have? Um, one example kind of comes to mind. I think any of you who may have a computer science department at your institution knows that that particular discipline, discipline has been dealing with all kinds of tools for a long time that help students code and, and learn. Uh, basic tasks in the field. And um, however, we do know that if students cheat their way through lower division courses in that discipline, by the time they get to the third year, they're going to struggle immensely because they will not be able to do some of the, the unique assignments that they're asked to do. Uh, and so this really speaks to the importance of integrity in just their academic work. But if we take it a step further, what what are we communicating to students about integrity in general in, um, in the industry that they're going to enter into? So many think, you know, in computer science that everyone just shares code and, and that's the way things get done. And certainly in many firms, that could be the case. But there are companies, particularly those creating perhaps proprietary software, where there's a lot of um, compliance and, and licensing policies that restrict sharing. And so there's a lot more emphasis placed on this original, original effort by the individual or the, the small team working on it, because the use of certain code may be prohibited because of the risk of potentially losing copyright on the product. So the question, I guess, to consider here is, are we doing an adequate job of helping un students understand the reality in terms of both the degree that they're pursuing, but where they're, where they're going in the industry that they're interested in, in terms of integrity? Um, and I'm sure that every discipline would be able to articulate this in some way and you know, think about how they're expressing this and, and really what is the purpose of learning and why are your students there? So um, next slide, please. Yesterday, eCampus uh, sponsored an event that really brought together nearly 150 of our faculty, both online and in person to talk about generative AI, and it was really interesting to hear faculty's comments and questions during this hour and a half event. Some of the themes that came up were, of course, you know, academic integrity, but also spending time recognizing students' inherent uh, desire to learn. There was conversation about that. The need for AI literacy among our students was it came up. Um, our associate dean in College of Business put forward an idea um, that our jobs as faculty are shifting to be less about content and more about thinking, evaluation, and application. And then, of course, there was conversation around a variety of ethical concerns and considerations. But I would say that if this is something that your institution hasn't done yet, uh, I'd really encourage you uh, trying to bring faculty together to talk about this topic, because it's a practical way to help give them some space to start thinking about how they're going to approach new technologies effectively in the classroom. Next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, what's a practical response? I, I would, would echo, you know, what George said. If you haven't tried it, try it out. Get into ChatGPT and, and experiment with it. And I think that's going to um, 
really help you understand, you know, how this might apply in your, in your particular space. But secondly, I would say one thing you should do is just clarify your expectations in your syllabus, you know, make it crystal clear. What are you expecting students to use or what are what are you expecting them not to use in terms of tools on their assignment? Just don't say do not cheat, but tell them what do you mean if do not by do not cheat? What kind of support tools can they use? What should they not use? We're really not at a point where there's any definitive way to prove that a you know chat GPT or some other AI tool has written a particular response from a student. But without a clear syllabus statement, even if you would have a any kind of conduct complaint related to this, it's just a non-starter. But it, it's just good for learning for students to know what your expectations are. The second action um, is to analyze and update your assessments. And if you haven't already done this, consider moving away from any kind of rote memorization or just reproduction of knowledge to more application and critical thinking and what you're asking students to do. So next slide, please. Um, so when you're analyzing your assessments, you might start by considering what AI currently doesn't do particularly well. And, and I'll have to admit, I've, I've had to change my notes a couple times just within the last week. So this is what I know today. This may change in another few weeks. So, but for now, um, AI tools currently don't, don't offer very personal answers. They're very impersonal. So when you're designing assignments, try to have, get students to connect back to specific course content um, that you had been discussing or a previous discussion that had been going on in the course, whether it's in person or, or online um, or personal experiences. Um, so if you can, the more you can customize those assessments to specifically to the course and what's happening in the course, the less likely an AI tool will be able to respond well. Number two, you know, assess the process that students are taking whenever possible, rather than just the end product. Um, so think about scaffolding projects throughout the term, showing the work leading up to the final project. Product. So it's much more difficult for AI to do that particularly well. And even better if you can get students to incorporate feedback from their peers or from you at certain stages, that also um, makes for a more robust assignment. Number three, you want to incorporate critical thinking and application when possible into the student's work. So, you know, ChatGPT can answer questions and generate a lot of text, but it's uh, more difficult for it to do complex problem solving. So rather than asking students to just summarize a theory, ask them to summarize or to apply the theory to a particular case, and even better if that case is one that you've created and that does not exist on the web today. So. Um, trying to find unique ways to assess. Um, fourth, consider if there's any hands-on tasks that you can include in your class. Experiments, artistic projects, simple observations of the world, anything that requires interaction with the physical world will allow you to um, ask, you know, have students producing more unique answers. Uh, consider also if, the, if your assessments can include any sensory input. Um, visual or auditory. Uh, right now, I know that ChatGPT doesn't do well with charts and graphs and that kind of thing. So um, that's one space that's still at the moment uh, generally okay and, and uh, helpful. Also along these lines, include analysis of information in unique files. So um, if you have questions in your assessments that are linked to um, several files that are not found on the web, you know, maybe unique data files or something that they need to analyze. This is another way to uh, make your assessments ro more robust. And then the last one, I, you know, I suggest you can incorporate numerical calculations simply because at this moment in time, ChatGPT isn't particularly good at math. It's not meant to be a math. Um, it's a la large language uh, uh, platform. It is not meant to, to use do math. It can do some, but complex math, it doesn't do terribly well on. So I would say overall, a lot of these suggestions are practices that we would recommend to reduce academic integrity issues generally in a course. So the, dif the difference now, I think, is that they're just a more compelling and urgent 
um, reason to take a little uh, to take more action. So next slide, please. So on the uh, on the flip side of this, I did want to call out that you could could consider integrating AI tools some into your assessments as part of teaching data literacy or the evaluation of writing. So you can think about start thinking about activities that help students answer one of these types of questions. You know, first is the response accurate? We know that um, as ChatGPT is ingesting information, that it's ingesting some inaccurate information, of course. And so responses are not always accurate. So students can practice looking for misinformation in responses coming from these, these tools. It, does the response exhibit bias? ChatGPT is again is influenced by bias within the information that it's ingesting. I understand it's ingested all of Reddit. That's not exactly you know an unbiased source. And so students can look at a paragraph produced by the tool and they could identify bias or other perspectives maybe that hadn't been considered or resources that maybe they thought uh, could have been highlighted. And, and then also the third question, what is this response from ChatGPT lacking? You know, does it exhibit a lack of understanding of context or of the world in some way? What's the underlying reality here that maybe it hasn't expressed? Um, and then I would also put a caveat in here, you know, realize that these tools sometimes are unavailable. I noticed in the chat, some people have said they've had trouble getting on. And so if you're setting something up for students to use this in your classroom or experiment with it, just be aware that they may not always be able to get on easily and so have some alternatives ready. So next slide, please. And then I just wanted to take a moment to also just consider the impact on the teaching profession itself and, and um, urge you to think about how these tools could be used in creative and informed ways to support your own work. So I know that we've had some faculty who are um, experimenting with creating elements for their course using, using chat GPT objectives, instructions, guides, rubrics, and those kinds of things. Um, it's great for brainstorming. So if you're trying to think of discussion prompts, you know, around a particular topic, it's a, a great place to kind of start, start the ball rolling or to gather research questions around areas that have, you know, still have uh, research that needs to be done. It's helpful in overcoming writer's block. But then there are also a few, you know, ethical questions that come in here too. Uh, you know, we know that ChatGPT can apply a simple rubric to a sample of writing and produce a, a grade and some, and some feedback. The question is, you know, should you allow AI to assist you in grading your materials like this uh, or student work like this? And then secondly, uh, I know a lot of our faculty, of course, a big portion of their work is research. And uh, should, how much should you call on AI to help you in drafting academic writing? I know that there are um, authorship requirements for different journals that pr uh, specifically prohibit the use of ChatGPT as a co-author. Um, so, you know, think about some of those things as you're thinking about where you might apply this tool in your own work. Um, just because you can use it, you want to think about whether you should use it. Um, next pair, or next uh, slide, please. And then just my final comment here um, is that, you know, as you're working with ChatGPT or any tool, just remember that they, they aren't human. They're, after, they're just merely searching for patterns across existing information and then creating these algorithms to produce a human-like response. Um, intelligence still includes that ability to solve novel problems, you know, challenges that have never been seen before. Um, and consciousness, which is, you know, awareness of memories and thoughts and feelings and the environment and all of that. Um, and although AI can, you know, find patterns and potentially predict what may happen given a set of circumstances, there is still that issue of human unpredictability that sets human thinking apart from that of computers. Those are my comments, and so I'm happy to take questions as well. Thanks, Karen. I'm going to exercise moderator privilege. There's there's a, a question I want to throw to George and then and, and Karen, you as well. Um, and then we'll get to the questions in the chat, is uh, in the Q&A rather. And, and folks, please continue to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, there are obviously some ethical issues, um, as you raised, Karen, about, about 
um, artificial intelligence and how it's used in the classroom. And a lot of that conversation has been couched in academic integrity. Um, I'll start with George and then throw it to you, Karen. What other sorts of equity issues should we be thinking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? I think so, and that's a fantastic question. And uh, it's, it's an extremely complex answer. You know, from a number of fronts. So, uh, you know, at UTA, we have a, a Master of Science in Learning Analytics that's running into our third year now. And we have a course devoted entirely to this question, right? In, is what are the ethics, the, the biases, the uh, equity dynamics, if you will, that exist within this kind of, uh, you know, approach to interacting with the world? And it's important to note that these uh, AI systems generally have at least the foundation models on which these kinds of chat GPT and other tool sets are built. And just a quick side note, it's worth emphasizing that there are already in the range of 300 plus startups, companies, and organizations that are using uh, GPT-3 on which to build products. So it's starting to become almost a type of an AWS or an Intel inside service where it's being used by organizations to do output. So whatever exists in that core data set is problematic. Uh, we have a thing in uh, psychology uh, research, at least, that addresses the concern of bias or uh, representativeness of your population of your samples. So if this was a research study, the first complaint someone would likely have if they were able to see a totality of data, which is enormous, because it's basically the accessible text of the internet up until about 2021, at least within chat GPT-3's case, uh, or the chat GPT uh, built, models built on. And so with that being the case, you end up with a lot of uh, the things that exist by the people who created. There's perspectives that I don't have access to because of my lived experience. And so if data is used to create a model or an algorithm based on what I know and what I've lived and what I've experienced, and that's applied to a population that has a different experience, you're going to immediately encounter issues of bias. Uh, you're going to encounter issues of my experience, my knowledge not being representative of a broader population, and as consequentially, the other subpopulations, their experience not being written back into the larger pool, if you will. And by pool, we're talking about these foundation models. I think there are the enormous bias and ethical concerns. Uh, this is work that Timna Gabru, uh, Emily Bender, and others have been pushing for, for many years, uh, with sometimes significant pushback from the academic community. So at minimum, on the ethical questions, we're dealing with uh, the data that underpins the model is representative of the people and the views and the values who created that data at the time that it was generated. And not everyone has had equal access to that creation. Uh, right now, it's obviously quite biased towards English. And so those are related challenges that arise. And so any deployment of AI in a classroom needs to reflect the fact, or at least be conscious that you are imposing a type of a worldview on the classroom, on the students, and even the responses that you receive. So just strictly from an experimental design or from a research design model, we're dealing with a sample that is not representative of unique subpopulations specifically or smaller populations that might not have been of active in creating that data. So uh, we, we're just on the cusp of an enormous set of ethical and equity concerns and any deployment of AI that doesn't have that as part of the conversation is missing probably the most important equity conversation that needs to happen on campuses. And what are what are the sorts of conversations you're having at Oregon State around the ethics and the equity issues that may um, come in application of these generative AIs? Well, I, you know, I, I think George described very well, you know, the the underpinnings of the the whole programming and every you know everything around it around the data going into it. I mean, we're concerned. I think from a faculty perspective, you're thinking about you know, what is it ingesting, not only the underpinnings of the code, but what is it, what is it taking in? Um, but also we've had a little, we've had some conversation about just equity in just access to the tools themselves. And, you know, what's going to happen when firms begin, as ChatGPT already has done, monetizing this and demanding, you know, putting up the barrier to those who, you know, have the funds to pay for subscriptions to help, to use these tools and those that don't. I mean, we also know that these tools are not available in every country. So I had been listening to, I think it was the Future Trends webcast the other week when Mahabali was on and said, this is not a tool that's available in Egypt. 
we cannot access this tool. You know, so there's also questions there around just physical access in terms of being able to, um, you know, beyond just the, the bias of the tool itself and what it's ingesting and what it's responding to. So those are a few additional things we're thinking about. I think that's actually a great segue um, into the first question that's over in the, the Q&A. Um, and it's, I think, thinking about access in a different way. Um, the, the question is, I'm wondering what the panelists are thinking about the use of something like chat GPT for students with disabilities who have written language disorders. I think this could actually be helpful for these students in helping them get a framework organization for a paper that they could use to build their own ideas around. So I'm wondering what, um, what y'all think. You know, we've talked about physical access. Are there ways that this tool can be used proactively to help students access education? Uh, well, I would say that I have heard um, of people using this to, for example, you know, in the K through 12 area, um, take a text and ask it to be rewritten in a different grade level. And as, you know, as there are different kinds of accommodations for students, this might be something that, you know, the normal, you know, an instructor may have spent a lot, a lot of time trying to locate something, you know, that was at a different grade level or had certain accommodations built in, whereas ChatGPT could produce that for them. And they would be more easily able to accommodate a student with that, with that particular need. Um, that's one example. Yeah, I think that's it's an important uh, point raised uh, because there is a way in which we use uh, technologies in general to to sort of extend human capacity, uh, whether it's you know physical technologies or whether it's uh, the first this growing generation of of technologies that allow us to create something that we might not be capable of otherwise. For example, I'm uh, fascinatingly incompetent at generating visual images. Uh, I, I have the aspirational soul of an artist and yet the skill set of a kindergartner with a crayon. And so uh, when when you start to, when I go to Dolly 2, for example, or Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion or any of these uh, you know, text to image generation models, uh, you know, I can create visuals that I'm not capable of creating without AI. So there is a sense in which that it can be addressed. Now, from a disability angle, you would certainly think at least with the right deployment and the right in, you know, inclusion of individuals who, you know, within you know community who deal with those kinds of challenges that you would make that a forefront of how do you deploy it? How is it representative? How does it support specific disabilities that they might have? Um, another component might be the uh, individuals who, let's say academic papers, you know, English as a, as a second language papers, just like Grammarly can help improve Prove basic uh, you know, skills with writing. I could see at least for creating a draft or a foundation uh, paper to get started in some areas to write a section of it or a paragraph or to put it in. I had a friend who is known for very curt emails and uh, I received some feedback from a supervisor that said his email uh, was a little too direct and affronting to colleagues. And so he has a new habit of taking the email he intended to write, put it into chat GPT and ask it to write it in the tone of a warm and caring email. And it will generate the email that he then copy and paste and drops in. So there's neurodivergent aspects aspects to it. There are, uh, you know, multi-language, uh, you know, English is a second language access to it to try and normalize to what we view as appropriate language and the list goes on. So I think there is a sense, at least we're seeing a glimpse of the potential that this might have as a tool set for addressing both disabilities or just varying life experiences or states of, at least in our case, English uh, language uh, capacity. That reminds me, uh, back in December, the Washington Post uh, ran a story about an individual who was dyslexic in uh, England and uh, ran a uh, landscaping business and, and had consistent challenges responding to emails from his clients and was using chat GPT to help write those emails that he was then sending to clients. And, and the, the result was that his business had actually increased significantly and he found himself getting new accounts um, because he sounded more professional than perhaps what he had sounded before whenever he was challenged with how to, how to 
communicate what he knew he wanted to communicate in the written word rather than orally. So I think that's those are really great points. One of the other questions in the um, in the Q and A that I think is really interesting that I'd, I'd love to hear y'all's perspective on. And Karen, I think I'm going to start with you on this one. And that's this question of that, that Jonah Brucker Cohen put in, and, and that is, why do we need to teach writing anymore? If tools like ChatGPT can generate any writing we would need and do it well, then why not use that instead of writing? Uh, will there be a pivot away from teaching writing into another form of deliverable or assessment for existing writing intensive courses? I'd love to hear your 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 thoughts on that. I used to teach writing intensive courses and and this sort of changes the game potentially. Well, you know, to some to some extent, I think initially everyone you know sees this in the way it can write a, a paragraph and they're immediately put it back by that by it. But um, we actually had in our discussion yesterday with eCampus, our director of writing across the curriculum, um, who joined us and spoke to this very question and and brought out the fact that there's really you know two reasons for writing and you know writing to learn and learning to write and you know writing to learn involves being able to uh, teach students how to articulate their thoughts which is an important piece in, in any particular field which is an important piece of just understanding and being able to advance your ability to critically think and and have more complex problem solving in a field if you can articulate what you're trying to say there's that and then there's this this idea of learning to write you know the, those foundational skills which may be a little bit more impacted by tools like this but i don't think they necessarily negate the reason that you, the negate the fact that students do need to learn to write you have i mean you do need it's it's a tool that I think is a good found. It perhaps provides some foundational support, but beyond that, there are more skills that need to be developed around writing beyond what you're going to get out of a, a you know a Chat GPT at least at this time. So there's more reasons to continue to write um, beyond what you know the, these, this kind of information that Chat GPT is able to produce. George, should we still teach writing? <laughs> uh, I think writing as a byproduct and as a mechanism for human thought is still uh, a critical need. And in many ways, uh, you know, what we're doing here uh, is a uh, you know global sense making conversation around which parts of our curriculum are still relevant, which domains of human thought are still sort of central to what it is that we want our education system to develop in in the future generation. Uh, John Warner, I'll just drop his uh, his info in in uh, in here, um, has been writing and addressing this for for a fairly long time. But I'm going to say it's it's a, it's a type of a I'll use a word I posted in chat earlier. It's a type of cognitive escalation that we're undergoing, which means if something if, if AI can do something well, then it allows us to do more complex integrated activities, right? So it's if AI solves a part of my daily workload, um, I don't sit there and stare at a wall <laughs> until that you know that's not wall staring time that it, I'm given back. Like I'll do something else. So if AI can help me write a draft of a paper. To help structure some thoughts, then I'll go in and I will uh, revise, I'll edit, I'll improve, I'll extend, I'll integrate. I dropped a slide deck in early. Ryan Baker shared sort of his editing process of working with ChatGPT. And I think that's what we're facing is we're moving from perhaps a product-based assessment of writing to a process-based assessment, uh, right? This idea of human and artificial cognition, where it's like, how do you think with this tool? Uh, do you have the right skills and literacies to create something with an AI system, whether it's writing or whether it's uh, image or whether it's video creation. Stephen Downs had an example of working with an AI system uh, to create video in his newsletter yesterday. And so there's simple illustrations like that. So I think the uh, the function 
of writing will remain critical because it's a mechanism for organizing and coordinating thoughts. Some of the grunt work, such as I know what's in my head, but I can't quite get it on paper the right way that I want it. So there'll be a, an engagement with the system to foster ideas, uh, you know, create divergent thinking, um, you know, this idea of think, pair, share, maybe, you know, think, chat GPT, pair, share, you know, in our uh, reflection of knowledge generation and so on. So I absolutely think there's an important role for writing going forward. Um, and in the end, when you think of it, I mean, chat GPT is, you know, it's a large language model, which means we're still communicating, interacting with, with language. So it's, it'll just move it up the chain a little bit where our activities are going to be spent uh, making the writing better or making it more integrated or more sophisticated or bringing in broader voices. So really what we're talking about is, is thinking about writing perhaps a little bit differently that we're asking students to reflect on the process. We're asking students to, to think about the sort of deeper skills that writing creates and, and not so much writing is just informational, um, the ability to express information. So I think it goes back to that critical thinking that you were talking about, Karen. Um, one of the other questions that I think is really fascinating that's, that's here in the chat has to do with workload. Um, what's your thoughts on the increase of faculty workload and what other offices on campus could do in conjunction with faculty who have to fight this battle mostly on their own? So what do you think this is going to do to faculty workload and who are the allies on campuses for faculty as they try to figure out what to do with generative AI in their classes? Well, I can do a quick run at that uh, first. So uh, we just had a, a meeting uh, in, at uh, University of Texas Arlington on this uh, this week, where the focus was on uh, we've run you know a couple of workshops on this with more to come. Uh, you know, on on uh, how do you support faculty? How do you encourage uh, adoption of uh, different types of technologies and approaches in classrooms generally? And so it'll probably fit into something like the Center for Research, Teaching and Learning Excellence, at least in UTA's case. But it's not a single faculty or single uh, department that's going to be responsible for developing this. Uh, it'll it's, it exists both at a departmental level. Uh, you know, the, the support for time to experiment with and use these tools, uh, the time as a faculty to argue about and debate what these tools do and how they should be utilized in, in an educational setting. Uh, there should be, I think, a very rigorous debate going on, at least at a faculty level, on what's, what is this role and what does it end up doing. But the short version, I think, is faculty workload with new technology at the start, at least, always has an increase. There's a new thing to learn, a new need to upgrade your teaching and learning practices. Uh, you know, with a, in the Master of Science, I mentioned early learning analytics program, I added a chat GPT description in each of the courses I'm teaching this semester uh, that says I encourage you to use chat GPT or generative AI in creating work. I have one course I'm doing now to, you know, on human and artificial cognition where that's one of the artifacts they generate, so it's embedded in it. But all of that is extra time, extra getting familiarity with it, updating your resources, updating, you know, whatever your lectures, your slides, your notes as you're presenting. So it is an increase in faculty time. We have not gotten in generally with new technologies to the point where it saves time. Karen, I saw you nodding your head in agreement. Yeah, I mean, any any new technology that comes comes along, it's going to take time to process it and to you know either integrate it or figure out how the you and your department are going to react to it. Um, I would say, at least in the term in terms of chat GBT, it's not that complex to use. It's actually quite a lot of fun to, to play with it. So um, it's not, you know, like some technology that we have where it's just, you know, really a mental lift to try to figure out how to make it work. Now it's, I think this one's really more about thinking about, you know, ethically and and all of those other questions, you know, how, should it be applied? Where should it be applied? Where should it perhaps not be applied? And then, of course, as George said, updating all of your um, course elements to reflect that, whether it be the syllabus or lectures or whatever, if you're integrating it in or if you're doing something else with it. But it's really a lot more discussion and thinking about what this means than it is actually perhaps learning the technology and trying to apply it. And in some ways, I think, too, I mean, I think faculty do need to think about um, you know, where can you apply it in your work to make your work more efficient? There may be places where it does make sense and that may give open up time for you to think about other things too. 
So I think this is a, a little bit connected here when we talk about faculty needing to sort of have time to think about incorporation and, and what it means. We have another question in the chat um, that really asks about, are there digital literacy skills that we need to be thinking about now, including in our curriculum to prepare students for this age of hybrid work where they are likely going to have to interact with generative AI in the workplace? How does that change how we think of digital literacy and, and teach critical thinking? Well, well I, I think there's absolutely a literacy component, uh, you know, in this area, uh, Van, that we haven't perhaps paid enough attention to. Uh, through Grail, we have a number of short courses that we'll be launching in the next uh, probably month and a bit that target exactly this, the AI literacy challenge. What is it that we should know and what should we be aware of? There's a number of organizations that are tackling this exact question at different levels. So Dury Long probably has done uh, some of the best AI literacy work uh, that I've come across, at least, uh, you know, as a general guidance on what you might want to do or what you might want to think about. And I've dropped a link for to some of her work in here. Um, she did a good paper on AI literacy uh, a number of years ago, I think about two years ago or so. So I think you might want to have a quick uh, look at, at, at that as well. Uh, the AI K-12 group has similarly produced some literacies and AI literacy resources as well. So I just want to emphasize that the literacy question is ongoing. And this is what I sort of said in my opening comments, which is, Chat GPT is a doorway into a very large room where conversations have been happening for several decades. And we're coming into a doorway and the Chat GPT crowd is coming in like they found Nirvana. And the rest of the crowd is like, what the hell guys, like, be quiet. We've got norms and manners and rules that we like to follow in here. And there's this very boisterous group that comes in thinking that they've got deep insight when there's people in this room like, like uh, uh, you know, Dr. Long that have exceptional expertise in domains that I, I'm concerned may be overwritten with this boisterous new entrance. Karen, are there, are there digital literacy skills that we need to be thinking about now that perhaps we weren't thinking about before? Yeah, I think it's probably even more critical now that, that we talk. I mean, we talked for a long time, you know, uh, about just information literacy skills and how that needs to be integrated into the curriculum. And now I think it just becomes even more critical, the advent of these kinds of technologies being made available to the public and to those in, you know, in industry, that this is also, this data literacy is incorporated into, you know, every degree area that students are are studying because it's it's just become um, something that we're going to it's not going away it's going to it's going to be here and it's going to grow and we need to be able to have students who are well versed in how to um, evaluate and assess and use these kinds of things or these kinds of tools for the in their work uh, so definitely yes we need to incorporate it more. Uh, there's a number of questions in the chat uh, around academic integrity. No surprise there. Um, I want to sort of collapse them all, though, and and ask each of you to to talk about um, what does does generative AI do to our academic integrity conversations that we have traditionally had at institutions? Is, it, is this really going to change those conversations? Does it make those conversations more critical than perhaps they were before? And, and how do we communicate that to, and open that conversation up to students? I don't know, George, if you were going to say something nope, there. Nope. Throw, throw it over <laughs> to you. Okay. All right. Well, I, you know, I, I think as I, I mentioned in some of the points I had made earlier, a lot of the, the responses that, you know, I was suggesting were the same kinds of strategies that we've been suggesting people use to um, make their courses and their assessments more robust already. So uh, I think it's, it's just another, I think in terms of academic integrity, we're just going to have to further this conversation. It's going to have to continue. And, it, and it's, it's in a way suddenly, you know, tools are making it where students can more easily, uh, you know, have code of conduct issues or whatever you might want to call it. it. It depends on how you interpret, you know, whether you should be using these in the classroom or not. So 
Um, yes, I mean, I, I don't know that it changes it remarkably, but it certainly means that we need to continue to have those conversations and we have to decide, you know, how are those tools going to be integrated into teaching and learning in a, in a way that still uh, keeps it, it keeps the students learning inherently inherent uh, to what they're to, to what we think they need to know as they come as they move through the university. So I, I'm not sure that it's a it's a huge change, but certainly it's something that, that needs to be discussed. I don't know, George, if you have more thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you know from an academic integrity lens uh, that that's a negotiated conversation right now because there are concerns of plagiarism, and this was one of the questions that came in earlier. And there's some counter tools being developed to combat that. Uh, I think the system, and I remember David Wiley or someone at least years ago had a statement to the effect, you know, like if it can be, uh, if you can cheat on the assignment, maybe it's not the right type of an assignment design. And the way that you're assessing by cheating, I mean, you know, automating or are you building in the right process indicators to assess that it's the student's work and so on. So I don't mean to dismiss this as an actual concern because with the way our classrooms are structured, you know, with the number of students we often have, especially at an undergraduate level, you've got hundreds of students that are being assessed and evaluated and you're not going to be able to target and flag everything. And so some of the challenges with generative AI is that it's not the student's work being passed as the student's work. And so we're assessing something that, that, that they didn't create. And so it's an inaccurate uh, assessment of their capabilities and competence. And that's gonna be a growing challenge as these tools get more sophisticated and as they get more complex and they get more involved. Um, I think the before we really start writing active policies, and which we should really unfortunately need to be doing ASAP, we really need to develop better literacy within faculty and within university leaders and academics specifically and support staff on what does ChatGPT actually do and which part of our existing education process does it challenge or change, and then get clear on that and then spend some time collaborative really identifying what is it that we would like to see our students learn with a technology technology that has some level of cognitive capacity we haven't experienced before. And so rather than an instinctual sort of banning or gut reaction to no longer using the technology or denying it in classrooms, we need to find a way to have a narrative around what the, in, or develop a narrative around what it is that we want this to be as part of our future uh, learning ecosystem. And the, the instinctual reaction that it's a plagiarism and that kind of an issue, I think it's, it's one that we need to have, but the more important one are what are the capabilities that we want to extend and uh, develop as a result of this. So it's a capability lens that we need to see, I think, in the long run because of what it affords us as new avenues for learning. So one last question. Um, I'm gonna use moderator's privilege here. If you could use just one word to encapsulate how you feel about where we are with generative AI right now. Optimistic. All right. Fascinated. <laughs> awesome. Megan, so thank you all so, so much. Megan, I'm gonna throw it over to you to close us out. Great, thank you, Van. Thank you, Karen and George. That was a really fun conversation. And thank you for the very active chat. That was fun to follow. So if you're new to WCET or if you're a longtime friend, do visit our website. We have lots of resources available and we're producing a, a, a resource on AI that'll be for members only as well as content on our website that'll be free and open to everybody. And I want to direct you to our upcoming events. We have a lot going on here at WCT over the next month. And much of that is free and open to members. And then we have our member summit coming up on March 9th the elements of evolving business models of higher education. And if you're not a member of WCET, if you join by the end of February, you receive two company registrations to the summit and it's a great program, you won't wanna miss it. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors that help underwrite what we do here at WCET and our supporting members. So again, thank you for everybody for being part of the WCET community and doing this exciting work that you all do. Take care. Bye all.